Good morning. Uh, my name's Kurt May, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the University of San Diego. Uh, we have a, uh, a series of speakers this morning, as you know. Obviously, that's why you're here. A couple of things I'd like to point out before we get started. Uh, we've got quite a cross-section of people here this morning, and I thought we were going to have to do a little more to get you talking to one another, but I see that hasn't been a problem either. So uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we do ask, uh, as, as I tell you each time, that you would please respect our custom of not bringing food and drink other than water into the room this morning. Uh, and as I've said before, it's those darned undergraduates, it's not us. But if you start it with us, then the undergraduates, you can't cap it there. So uh, we'll, help, we'll thank you for helping us with it. Uh, two things that I'd like to talk about. Number one, uh, this uh, breakfast meeting this morning is sponsored by the master's degree programs in the School of Business at University of San Diego. In particular, you, you may know we have nine such programs. In particular, we have three programs that focus primarily on leadership. We have a master's degree in science in supply chain management, a master of science in global leadership, and a master of science in executive leadership. We have people here this morning that can tell you more about that, and there are uh, brochures out on the front desk that can uh, bring you up to date on each of those. In addition to that, uh, we've announced before that we now offer executive education programs whereby we bring our faculty off campus to your site and we'll train you and your team in your office location on issues that are of interest to you. And there's a flyer outside that introduces uh, some of these programs. We don't have the flyer this morning? I have some flyers in my car. I will have those here by the end of this meeting. And lastly, I'd uh, just like to point out a couple things. Uh, Number one, I'd like to introduce you to a new word. That word is oximethy. Does anybody know what that is? Or is there spelling competition to it? Yes, it is. <laughs> if I got that wrong, it's not. Anybody know what oximethy means? Oximethy is a word that means studying or learning later in life. That's what we're here to do today. That's what our theme is with executive education. That's what the master's degree programs are all about, is to give you the tools to continue your journey as a professional. And we have nine such options for you. The second thing I want to remind you of is a couple of dates. The next breakfast meeting will be on May 10th, uh, excuse me, May 12th. It is going to be in the IPJ across the uh, way here. Uh, the folks from Blue Ocean Strategy will be in presenting the notion of Blue Ocean thinking and uh, how that might apply to you. And the final date that I point out to you is August 8th. August 8th is the date on which Cohort 12 of the Master of Science and Executive Leadership program begins. So if you're interested, uh, we're beyond the halfway point in terms of admissions now, and we do have people in the queue. I would encourage you to very, very quickly see us after the meeting, get your materials together, and uh, we'd be delighted to welcome you into that program. Now, let's get on with the uh, topic for the morning. It's my pleasure to introduce to you a colleague of mine for many, many years, a man for whom I have enormous respect. Uh, Delphoy teaches at the Rady School of Management the subject of new venture creation and has made a difference in uh, hundreds, perhaps thousands, of graduate students' lives over there, many of which have gone on to launch very successful ventures. Uh, Dell's going to talk to us this morning about some of the keys to taking an idea from concept to cash flow. So Dell, you ready to go? So I want to talk to you this morning a little bit about how do you identify an opportunity? How do you take an idea and you start moving it to an opportunity and really see if there's really a business behind it? So opportunity, innovation, and business model, you know, that's the components of a compelling business plan as well as a pitch. And I'll take you through the business plan piece and then the developing of a pitch, which really is how you get people excited about your business opportunity. And it'll be followed by Dan, and Dan has a pitch, which he'll talk about hometown farms, right? So it's really about an opportunity. Everything else, an idea, okay, that's really good. We all have thousands of ideas in the morning. But really, is there an opportunity, a business opportunity behind your idea? Right? So you look for sea changes. Where do things happen that really become opportunities for us? And you think of it in terms of how do things occur which change the way we live, work, play, and learn? Those are the biggest opportunities. And these we talk about sea changes, spawning grounds from 50,000 feet and above. The first one is technology. Looking at technology, how is that technology emerging and evolving? Moore's law, right? That's where the power of the computer 
doubles every 18 months, and effectively the price on a chip halves every 18 months. Really significant. That's why we have so much power on our desktops nowadays. You look for market sea changes. What's happening in the marketplace? I think Dan's going to address that. He's got a little bit of technology as well as what's happening in the marketplace. And then you look at societal sea changes. Where are the things that really change the way we live, work, play, and learn? And Dan addresses that area specifically, societal changes. And Gilder's Law is where the bandwidth is, I think it's six times every 18 months. So effectively, the bandwidth, if you tie that to Moore's Law, the bandwidth triples every six months. Imagine that today, what that's allowing us to do with the internet. You can video stuff instantaneously. And the other ones, yeah, that's just big business type stuff, right? And arrogance, right? So how do you look for these pains and opportunities? It's innovation. Innovation is a disciplined approach by searching for ideas and opportunities behind them. So look at unexpected occurrences. An unexpected occurrence would be, everybody remember the Etzel? The development of the Etzel, right? Beautiful car. Ford did its tremendous research to develop that car. They took it to the marketplace, nobody bought it. That was because their market segmentation and research was all wrong. What they learned from that was about that time is when lifestyle cars came in and people started buying the Mustang. The Mustang was developed and that became the lifestyle car. So cars changed. Incongruities. What happens on an incongruity, right? Well, think about for a moment the um, shipping industry. So back in the 40s and 50s, what they were trying to do is big, build bigger and faster cargo ships, right? Use less fuel. It was really doing pretty well. About the 50s, though, that industry almost crashed. What happened? They found that the cost for running the ships was really because they were tied up in port. They couldn't unload and offload as fast as they should. So what evolved from that? Cargo ships, containers. All of a sudden, you have containers going on and off, rolling on and off, right? Process needs, changes in industry and the market. Significant things happen when industries start growing at 40% growth rates per year. The industry structure changes. If you can peg that, you can see where there might be some innovation within there. Think of things in terms of the big box stores, right? The big box stores became a process change, changes in industry and the market. People want to buy in bulk. You got Costco, you got Staples, you got office supplies, et cetera, et cetera. So the small shops went away, the big box stores came in. Social and intellectual environment, demographic changes, significant, all right? I'm, par, I'm the beginning of the baby boomer generation. Think of all the opportunities for healthcare that can be created and evolve, to satisfy my needs going forward. Another area which was identified as demographic changes is Japan. Japan realized after World War II going into the 50s that their birth rate was declining more and more people were getting educated, that meant there'd be less and less workforce available, blue collar workforce. They recognized that fact, they saw that train, trend, and what did they develop? They started focusing in on robotics. Japan leads robotics development, right, in their industries, et cetera. Also, you have Sony, all those little human robotic type things. The projection is that as people get older, there's gonna be nobody to care for them, they're going to evolve those robotics to the point where they will care for us, right? It'd be like, uh, what was that? What was that one? Uh, pardon me? Rosie. Rosie, right? It was one of them. But I'm, I'm trying to think of the old um, TV series, Robinson. Danger, Danger, Ro Will Rogers or whatever, right? right? Robinson. Robinson, right? Will Robinson, right? And changes in perception, right? So we want to be more healthy. We are more healthy. We're living longer. But as a result, what has come into play? More and more 24-hour fitness, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. L magazines on health. How can you be healthy? If you watch, if I read the Union Tribune every day, there's a section in there on health every day, right? Think about how you can do things. So when you look at those, where are the pains, where are the opportunities? You can develop a product around that using those as sources of ideas. And new knowledge, that's invention. That's the newest thing out, right? The first idea of something. But the real key is how do you take that new knowledge and move it into an innovation to seize an opportunity, a commercial opportunity behind it. What does that lead you to? The first thing you have to think about with this, if you have a market, what's your business model like, right? It's 
these main things at the bottom. What do you sell? Who do you sell it to? Where do you sell? When do you sell? And why do you make money? Because new product development is about making money for companies or for businesses. Everything else is secondary, <laughs> but it's about making money. How are you going to make money out of a new product, right? And how do you provide, provide a differential value to your customers? Right? So I try to think of, you have an idea, you generate it, you assess it, you evolve it. It's a never-ending circle because it keeps on getting better and better every time you look at it. So how do you evaluate a venture opportunity? Right? You look at these seven areas. Look at the industry and the marketplace. Is there room? Is the market growing? What product are you trying to get into it? Look at the economics. Forget about the detailed numbers, but really at the economic level. Does it make a profit? How much can you sell it for? How much does it cost you? What's your gross margin? What's your free, fro free cash flow characteristics? Right? When are you going to break even? When are you going to recoup your investment? When do you become cash flow positive on a month-to-month -month basis? Right? What's your competitive advantage? Why is your product going to be better than someone else's? Right? What's the next best thing? You know, why is the Apple MacBook better than the Dell PC? For me, it's ease of use. User interface is real easy. I plug it in, it just goes up. I don't have to go function five. Right? That's how I differentiate on the Mac. And it's also more expensive, but I'm willing to pay the premium for that because it services my unmet need, my pain. I am not a techo geek, right? I want the thing to work when I turn it on, that's all, right? And your management team, do they have high integrity? Do they know the business space you're going to get into? Can they work together? What are your own personal criteria, right? What's your risk reward tolerance? A lot of people are risk averse. If you want to identify an opportunity and follow it, there's a little bit of risk involved. You've got to put some of your own money in it. You might not take some money. You might go in debt for quite a while. And then strategic differentiation. How are you going to define yourself different from all the other people that are out there? Right? So how does Dell differentiate itself from Hewlett Packard or from Mac? Do they really? Does it become a big blur? And the only real thing is out there is the Apple versus the PC. Is that the two? Right. So the business plan. Am I going too fast so far? Because I have a time schedule I've got to go to, right? So the business plan, what's the purpose of it? It really carefully articulates the merits and requirements of your business. You start asking questions. It really focuses down on do you have a business behind you? And the next one I'm going to go is the four anchors. So we come up with this thing, and it comes out of the textbook, Tim and Spinelli, New Venture Creation, about the four anchors of superior business. So you have an idea. You think there's an opportunity behind it. You start looking at the business model. You, okay, the numbers look pretty good. right? Okay, I can differentiate myself. You start putting all those pieces together. Now you're starting to put it together in a business plan. right? Business plan has all that market research, et cetera. But We've defined the fact that in certain businesses, it's great to be a lifestyle business, right? Doesn't really, it's pretty good. You can put food on the table, you can put a roof over your head, you can put clothes on your back. But if you really want a superior business, you have to go to the four anchors, right? You're creating a significant, you're creating significant value for a customer, right, who wants to buy your product. What's their compelling need to buy your product? you're going to solve a significant problem. Right? One of those problems out there that you're trying to address with the, with the business. And then you're looking at your robust market and money-making characteristics. We suggest to students that look at markets that are $50 million or greater. Right? That gives you an opportunity to get in there without getting squeezed. If you get a big market, you got some big players in it, you can probably go under the radar screen for quite a while and eventually create a big enough imprint that they think they really got to buy you. That becomes your exit, right, if you have a great product. Look for high growth, 20%, high margins, 40%. Right? You don't want a business that's declining. Why would you want to get into a business that the market is declining or a commodity business? You know, that's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, right? If you're doing things and making pennies on the dollar as margins, one hiccup and you're out of business. 
you got free cash flow, high profit potential, and re nice returns for investors. When I was working for J&J, Hoffman LaRoche, Beringer Mannheim, one of the measurements as a senior officers of the company was the free cash flow. We realized one time that on a month-to-month -month basis, our P&L really looked good. We we're making a lot of money. But because we had so much inventory, we we're building buildings and taking our capital, we had no free cash. We weren't putting money in the bank. We had to go rent, uh, borrow money. So you have to look at free cash flow. Where's the money coming on a month-to-month -month basis? And can you put it away for that? Oh my God, something went wrong, right? And is it a good fit, right, with the founders? I'm a life sciences guy, right? I don't think I would fit very well in a high-tech company. I know about life sciences, but I don't know about computers and Moore's Law and Gilder's Law and all those things. I would have a big, steep learning curve. So why would you want me on a team like that? However, if it's a life science team, you want to talk about biotech, pharmaceutical, medical devices, then I'm the person that fit in there because I know about that space pretty well. Right? Does that make sense, everybody, so far? Right? It's really how you define a superior business. So let's go into the business plan a little bit. Right? Too much time is usually wasted on the numbers. This is an outline for a business plan. Right? Really, you want the other information that's in there, which is really important for an investor to make a decision on whether or not you really have a viable, sustainable business opportunity. Right? Anytime you develop a plan, right, it's obsolete the day it comes out of the printer. So all your forecasts really don't make a hell of a lot of beans. Order of magnitude, it's great. But that's why the economics of the business really is important. Anybody who's going to invest in it realizes that your numbers are about as good as the powder to blow them up with on that day, right? Because something's going to happen, right? So you want the business model, which I talked about earlier. You want a well-thought-out business model, and you want to articulate that in the plan. You want to define the offering. What is the product you're going to produce? What's the service you're going to provide? What is it and what is it not? Right? The yin and the yang of it all. You want people to understand these things. And as I get into how do you pitch this, you'll see how this all comes together when you start creating a story. You know, what are the key drivers of the success of the venture? What are some of the key risks? And there's a lot of literature coming out just now, recently, that most of the inventor and investors want you to identify the risk and what are your risk mitigation strategies. Right? Really important because they know things are going to go wrong and their confidence in you will go up if, in fact, they know that you can identify all the risks that are out there. Right? And again, cash flow, break even, and resource needs. What increments are you going to need as you grow the business? Right? So I try to look at this as people, opportunity, context, and deal. I'll go in these a little bit deeper, deeper, right? Like the four anchors, and this comes out of a Harvard Business Review article uh, put out by a guy by the name of Salman, S-A-H-L-M-A-N, it's hidden over there, right? So people, really important. You can have a great idea, but if you don't have the right team, you can't execute on it. So businesses are really made up of people. People first, then you have your processes, then you have your brick and mortar, unless you're a virtual business, right? What's the business itself? How is it going to grow for your opportunity? You know, big picture context. Everything happens in context. What's the regulatory environment out there? In the, F, in the life sciences industry, that's a big thing. How is the regulatory environment changing? And today, what about the intellectual property environment, IP? That's changing very rapidly. It's harder and harder to get patents on things. Or, in fact, what happens Patents are invalidated. What if you have a patent on a product and all of a sudden it gets invalidated by the high courts? What are you going to do? Do you really have a business anymore? So that's the context you have to think about your businesses, right? And the deal. What's the contract going on between people and today and the future? So here's some questions to ask about the people and the team. These what are what investors are going to be asking. What's the background? What's their experience level? What's their aspirations and motivations? There's one guy in town I know who's, before he invests in a business with an entrepreneur, he'll say, would you rather own one-tenth of one percent of Google, or do you want to be the king of the hill of some business? 
And if the person says, I want to be the king of the hill, they walk away, right? Because it's a big ego thing. They want to be the king. I'd take one-tenth of one percent of Google easily and let someone else run the business. <laughs> it's easy for me, right? And are they, t are they tenacious? Are they resilient? Because there's a lot of these oh craps in a business, right? I started a business with three other guys in the biotech space, and we had a lot of oh craps, <laughs> right? But we managed to stay together and we're still friends, which is important, right? So how committed? Yeah, we were committed. We put a lot of money, our own money into it, but eventually we knew we had to cut bait, right? It just wasn't working anymore. Can you make that decision? None of the other parts of the business plan really matter, like I said earlier. Right? So what's the total market of the venture? This is what's got to be in your business plan. Is it large, growing? Right? Is it going to be structurally attractive in the future? Think about the telecommunications industry. We'll talk about context. What happened when deregulation came into telecommunications? All these things started popping up, right? The whole structure of the industry changed <laughs> overnight. Who's your customer? Who's your first customer? And how are you going to get to that customer? And who's the second customer, et cetera? How, long, how much does it take to acquire a customer? I'm going to get this customer, but if it costs you a million bucks to acquire the customer and the customer's only worth $900,000 in revenue, is that really a good decision, right? Unless you're thinking about longer term revenues. And how about supporting of the customer? When I was working in Beringer Mannheim, we had a saying that said, uh, no sale prior to service. Unless we can guarantee service to the customer, we would not go after that account. Because we knew our differentiator in the diagnostics business was service to the customer. We guarantee 99.99% uptime 24-7 on instrumentation. So if you can't service the customer, don't make the sale. It's going to kill your reputation and your brand. Right? No competition, big red flag. How many people have heard someone say, I got a product, there's no competition out there? <laughs> Jay, you have, right? Your product's today, right? <laughs> but there always is competition. It might not be there today, but it might be there tomorrow. If you have a great idea, someone else has probably got the same thing. But you start looking at, you do SWOT analysis on them. Strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats. Right? What's their strengths? What's their weaknesses? How does that match up to yours? Right? How are you going to respond? So think of it, business as a big chess game. Right? Someone's going to make a move, you're going to make a counter move. And the idea is to checkmate them. Right? Get them in the corner so they can't win. You're playing to win, not playing not to lose at the end of the day. Right? In context, talk about Economy, regulation, geopolitics. Regulations, De you know, deregulation airlines. What happened when that occurred? Right? All the startups jumped in, right? Which startup is still existing today? Southwest. Southwest had a pretty cool business model, right? What was it? One plane, 737, right? Point to point, not cross country. But they're evolving the business model as they have to become more competitive. Think of all the savings they were allowed within the logistics and infrastructure of their company by having one plane. Training pilots on one plane, they can go from one plane to the next. They didn't have to worry about, what about their parts and their mechanics, right? As opposed to having a whole diversity of planes they got to work on. Pretty cool business model. They're still profitable. They're still doing pretty good, right? So it's the right context at the end of the day. Regulations. We just talked a little bit about that. Uh, the economy, you know, <laughs> who can predict the economy? But you know, a couple years ago, it was not the time to try to really go out and get venture capital. It's still kind of tough today. It was also tough to get loans. So if you can predict the economy and capture that nugget, that's pretty good. But that really has a pro you know, becomes a problem with your business. Right? So, you know, what's the deal? True entrepreneurs want to capture all the reward and give all the risk to everybody else. That's the way life is, right? So how do you do that? But you can have a little bit of risk. So the idea is to move things around with them, get a deal. What's the deal today? What's the deal tomorrow? What's the structure of the deals out there? Will they impact favorably or not favorably on your business? Right? 
So they're, investors would be asking these things. How much capital do you need, right? Do you need a million, two million dollars? How's it going to be tranched, et cetera, right? How are you going to get your personnel? Where are they going to come from, right? And what's your exit strategy? Everybody wants to know what their exit strategy is. Five years, two years, three years right now. I'm invested in the company up in Carlsbad in the medical device space, right? And we're having a tough time of it, like everybody else out there. But it's moving forward. And son of a gun, the market's getting bigger for us because we've found another application for the product, J, right? It's a big market all of a sudden. And we have some other people now who've noticed that we're out there, competitors. And now they're coming and saying, hey, what do you guys really have? Can we use part of your product as a, uh, as a base material for ours, right? Which is pretty unique all of a sudden. So if you get out there, right, you're going to find competition. They might want to acquire you. So we talked about acquisition strategies, and we figured when, we when I was getting on the board of this company and investing, maybe an extra strategy in about five years or so. Right? It might be a little bit sooner right now if things keep on going its way. Right? So really, you know, investors are going to look like how much time and how much money is going to take you to get to break even, right? cash flow positive. And if it's very long, people are not going to invest in you. So how about if we talk a little bit about the business plan, the business pitch now? Everybody still with me? Okay. Whew, I'm going fast. Am I okay? I'm on time. His is a lot better than mine. Mine's really dull, right? This is academic stuff. His is the real life stuff. Dan's the real life stuff, <laughs> right? So everything has its own unique flow. And I'm going to go through a template and I'm not going to go in detail on the template, but I just want to leave you with a message on how to communicate your pitch, okay? And really what you want to do as a business person is get that second meeting. Even a, even a salesperson out in the field calls on a customer for the first time. They don't know if they're going to make the sale that day. They're not going to close that day. But they want to get that business going. They want that rapport going so they can come back for the second time and get called back again. Right? So business is about people to people at the end of the day. It's not about your product or your service or your process. That's really nice. But it's a people-to-people -people thing. You got that rapport going, right? So people call back and they believe in you, right? The big thing is they believe in you and your product, and you are representing the product to them. At the end, right? So you want to essentially assess your audience in the very beginning. You know, you want to make a compelling story and a presentation to them. You want to demonstrate your knowledge of the business area your knowledge of the market, the research you did. You do that in your company, in your overview. So I say, here's the company, this is what I'm doing, right? where I'm going. Right? You want to engage them. right? You want to say, hey, you know what? This is the opportunity. This is the problem. And this is how it impacts you, and this is how you can help me. This is the opportunity we have there. So you start going into what the size of it is, what's your penetration. Is this a niche market or a larger market? So you want to define what your solution is. So you assess, assess them, you engage them, you're starting to define for them where you're going with this business. Right? And through this whole thing, you're starting to tell them a story. Right? And why do you want to tell a story? Stories are very simple. Right? They compel them, they deliver a message without a lot of hype. Right? It's the oldest tradition of, of talking to someone. You tell them a story right? and how it impacts them and why they should be involved with you. So you go through the market size. How big is the market? And you give them a bunch of subplots as you go along. Right? You talk a little bit about the technology. What is the technology? You don't go into detail, but just an overview. This is how it's going to work, and this is how it's going to solve the problem that I'm addressing. What is your competitive advantage? Why is your mousetrap better than company ABCs? What specific? Is it 10 times faster? Is it 10 times cheaper? 
Does it kill the mouse without the mouse screening? Right? You have a bigger, harder spring on there. Right? Who is the competition? ABC. Are they in business for very long? Do they have enough resources to sustain themselves if you get into a price war? Do you have enough money to sustain yourself if you get into a price war? Right? And your business model and go-to-market strategy. Investors are really want to understand how are you can get this product out there. How many have read Crossing the Chasm, that book? Right? If you get a chance, read that book. Right? It's a technology. How do you get a technology to market? But I think it has application across all businesses. How do you identify your first customer? You got the visionaries, the early adopters. How do you get into essentially the tornado where all of a sudden it starts selling itself for you? Right? And what do your financials look like? You know, everybody's got to have financials, but again, the economics are the most important part. Right? And who your management team is at the end. And if you're seeking investment, how much money do you need? You start in the opening with that one. So, right, you look at your, your audience, you assess them, you engage them, you define for them what you're trying to do, and you tell that via a story. An easy way would, why were you in this, why did you identify this opportunity? How did you identify it? And Dan, right, as my conversation with Dan, it really was unique on how he identified this opportunity and how he became so compelled to bring it to market, right? He put a bunch of threads together of different things and said, wow, this could be really something, right? And then you summarize it to them, you know. You want to leave them with five messages or three messages that they want to tell you and bring you back to listen to you again, right? Because you're competing for funding with everybody else. Any questions on any of that? All right. Right? And remember, sincere, brief, and be seated at the end. And then I'll leave you with this one. <laughs> I like my buddy Dilbert. That's it. Okay, so now... To get to the concept, you know, one thing I think everybody will find is that ideas never are where they are when you first think of them. It, it's an evolution. It's a process, and almost like what Dell said. You really kind of go through a process of saying, okay, this is a great idea, but as you look into it, you find either faults or things that are wrong, and you start to change those. Uh, what it started for me and my partner, Mike Castro, is in the audience here. It, it started for me first, where I was approached by um, some doctors, and they wanted me to take some uh, nutraceutical products to market. And I quickly, after doing some homework, I realized that nutraceutical products are not much better than pharmaceutical. Even though they're based on, on plants, th th there's a major component that's missing. That's called probiotics. So after doing a bunch of research, I actually went back to the doctors and I said, look, I got to pass on the deal because really the deal isn't what I was looking for, and that is to really do good in every aspect. So um, I passed on it, and there was a gentleman in the room, really smart gentleman. He goes, so, okay, whole food you're telling me then is really the future. And I said, absolutely. And he goes, well, then it sounds like we need to grow some food. And I said, because all these, you know, uh, vitamins and uh, uh, supplements and everything else that are coming out onto the market. So he goes, well, instead of betting on a racehorse, Let's grow the hay and feed all the horses. I said, what a, what a brilliant idea. So um, I contacted Mike, uh, who's just a walking encyclopedia of farming. I'm a soils expert. This guy knows more about farming than I could ever know in, in 10 lifetimes. So I call him up, and I, I start to explain the opportunity. He goes, yeah, this sounds like a great opportunity. So uh, we were looking out at Imperial Valley, and the reason being is that Imperial Valley has some of the best water rights in Southern California. It'll probably be one of the last places to go dry if the water gets cut off. So we went out there and we looked at it, and long story short, the water supply is not tied to any one particular property. It's a pooled event. So as a business, there's really no play there. And then on top of that, as we started, Mike and I started looking at that, we realized that we couldn't differentiate ourselves from everybody else. Once we put that produce into the box and we shipped it into the city, 
we'd have to spend millions and millions of dollars trying to tell everybody that we're the best. Where in all reality, the guy next to us or the person next to us could be saying the same thing and not even doing half as good as us, but yet we have to spend the money to do it to do it right. So we realized that there was really no true solution or differentiating point there and not worth going down that venture. So we pulled the plug on that one also. And then it was about two months later, I get a call from Mike and he goes, Dan, I got the solution. I'm like, what's that? And he goes, vertical farming. And I said, what's that? And he goes, and he, he explained it to me. And I just, we got really, really, I got really excited because it would give us a point in which, at least economically, we could make a difference from what everybody else was doing out there. So we got together, we started brainstorming, and one thing led to another to where we said, what if we move this into the city? What does that model look like? So we, we put the model together, and lo and behold, it was phenomenal. And hence, we started Hometown Farms. Um, what I'm going to do is, is kind of take how we took that concept, and out of all of our research, all of our homework, and what we ended up doing is putting this together. This is, this is kind of a watered down pitch because I didn't feel like this was really the space to which I should be pitching like I normally do to VCs. It's more of an educational type thing. So it's kind of a watered down version, but it really does follow what Dell was just talking about because really unless you can communicate that story, you're not gonna get anywhere anyways. So really what we're doing is, is we're the first company to really introduce commercial, vertical, organic urban farming. And that's what we do. We build farms in the city, grow produce, and then sell that produce to the public. So what we needed to do is identify what's the pain? What's the problems out there that we can solve? Well, one of the biggest ones is the high cost of quality food. And as you can see here from the chart, uh, I, you know, growing food is just becoming more and more expensive. And if anybody's visited Whole Foods, they understand that. Um, and, and I think a lot of people want to buy quality food, but just can't afford it. Another part, part of it is, is um, as a consumer, <laughs> I think I spend a tremendous amount of my time looking at marketing and trying to figure out, okay, are they telling me the truth or do they just want my dollar and I'm gonna buy something that's not really what they're marketing to me? So I think that's a huge part of our society right now. And then food safety. Um, you know, you see all the headlines, E. coli, contaminations, people dying, recalls, imported food. I think it's really concerning to people that you could actually die or get sick just from eating. Another one is, is that our, our agricultural system, because of our growing population and our shortage of water and the changing of, of the environment, it's unsustainable. We cannot continue to feed the amount of people that we have on Earth. And, and now with the projections of going up to like, you know, nine and a half or 10 billion people by 2050, it's only gonna get worse. And I truly believe that people want to be able to support a change, but there's really not a big change out there. There's not a lot of options out there that people can actually choose to make a difference. So, looking at our model, where's the solutions? How are we doing that? Well, basically with this commercial vertical organic urban farming, we can provide organic food at non-organic prices. We are growing it in the city, and people now can see actually where their food is grown. So they can actually start to trust and know exactly what they're getting. Since our model changes the way that the food is grown, we don't have mass pickings, we don't have to send the food to central wash areas. So we virtually eliminate the need for central wash areas where most of your E. coli and your contaminations come out. And then now we've actually given the consumer a truly another option that they can choose to make, to do, make something better, to choose something that they want to do. So, kind of pain solution, now why? Well, bottom line is, we can save people 30 to 60% off of their produce. That's huge. Since we are brought the farm back into the city, we can literally have our produce be vine ripened. Most produce gets their nutrients in the last two weeks on the vine. Well, in our current system, we pick our produce two to three weeks early. And then for every day that it takes to get to the market, it loses its nutritional value. So not only did we start with less than what you really should have had, but time it gets to the market's quite a bit less than that. So by moving it into the city and vine ripening, we're actually providing the most nutritious food possible. And on top of that, the best tasting food.
So all those great claims, now you've got to say, well, how do you do it? Is it magic? What are you doing that you can actually make those types of claims? Well, what we figured out was by moving the farm into the city, we have actually reduced the amount of people and steps and processes needed between the farm and the retailer. So as you can see here, basically we've eliminated packing sheds, distribution, wash houses, distributors, all of these steps of what it takes to get the food from the farmer to the consumer. Here's our model. We grow it in the city, we sell it in the city. It is as efficient as it gets. Now, combining that with going vertical, as Mike you know, had pointed out, and that was really the key point that got us on this path. And with our vertical farming, these farming systems save 85% of the water, 80% of the fertilizer, and utilize only one-sixth to one-eighth of the land. And then on top of that, because you've moved it into the city, you've reduced the fuel consumption and carbon output by 90%. Because you're not transporting it hundreds or thousands of miles, you're only transporting it a few miles, a half a dozen miles. So when you're looking at it and you take the transportation cost out, the water, um, pest and disease, fertilizer, you can see that the costs just come down. So we really now have a differentiating point for our company. So the business model, taking all of those loose pieces, as Dell said, and putting it into a cohesive model. And really what we found is, is that moving into the city, doing what we do, we become the entire supply chain. We're the farmer, we're the distributor, we're the retailer. And so really what you do is you look at how your model goes together and what's the existing businesses out there and how can they stop you. And really with this model we felt that we were complete enough to where the big distributors and the big retailers couldn't stop us. Reason being is we don't need the big distributors. We made the paradigm shift of instead of growing massive amounts in the middle of nowhere, we grow smaller amounts inside the city. So we'll build a farm that can service a five mile radius. And once that farm sells out, we don't build a bigger farm. We purely go down the road five or 10 miles and build another farm. And hence then we continue to capture the market for each individual neighborhood. So by doing that, we are not at the bay of the big distributing companies. And then also with the big box um, retailers. Obviously, you know, as big business goes, if they want to, they can say, look, you distribute his product. That's okay, go ahead. <laughs> you won't distribute ours. Well, the distributor is not going to distribute your product because obviously that's big business for them. So we made sure that we were basically immune to the existing systems because if you don't, as Dell had pointed out, they want to win and they're going to stop you. So we believe that the model was so solid that we could actually avoid the usual pitfalls of big business. Another thing we found, and this is kind of going back a little bit, but because of all these supply savings, even though you have increased land cost and increased labor cost because you're hiring within the city, it still doesn't outweigh all of the savings from your infrastructure, from, from the processes that you've eliminated. So it's very worthwhile. And, and again, our model, we make money from selling produce. We go and build farms, we grow it, but really our revenue stream is from selling produce. We have secondary revenue streams, as you can see there, but our primary one is really selling the produce. So technology, as Dell said. There's, there's IP play and then there's, there's branding and operation plays. Um, in my past business, um, we founded a self-heating container in which me and some buddies had a, over 102 utility patent claims approved in over 37 countries. I'm an IP guy. I understand IP extremely well. But food is not really one of those plays unless you're uh, Archer Dan Middleton and uh, you know, you're going to genetically change something and then you're going to patent it. But that's not what we do here. So what we decided is, and actually I've got to give credit again to Mike, what Mike did was went around the world, did his homework, and found existing growing systems that were hydroorganic, not hydroponic and not aeroponics, and I can get into more of that later. But the, the kind of growing system that we were looking for would allow the soil to be alive. So all of those probiotics that humans need, well, guess what? Plants need them also. 
because that's how they build their immune system. That's how they produce the best possible fruit. So we decided that that was how we were going to go, not only vertical, but also the hydroorganic. And then we didn't want to reinvent the wheel, so we found those existing systems that would allow us to do that. And just an example here, this is Spain, a uh, southern tip of Spain. And back in 1974, they had a couple hundred acres right here in the little center area. And by the year 2000, there was over 50,000 acres of these types of growing systems and shade houses. Obviously, it's extremely profitable, but their model is just still wrong. They're growing one or two crops in mass production, and then they're shipping it in, where our model is to grow smaller amounts within localized area. And that kind of came from uh, the renewable energy, where really decentralization is the key component of making it a viable business. We took that concept and moved it over to us. So market size and vision, obviously like Dell said, you know, unless this market is huge, do you really want to try to go down there? And so what we figured and found out is that San Diego has 3 million people. Our country has over 300 million. And according to USDA, the average American consumes about $5 a week in produce, which actually is a shame within itself. It's pretty low compared to everything we eat, but that's okay. Uh, so as you can see from just the population in San Diego, if everybody was just to buy their vegetables local, there's a potential of $750 million in possible sales just here in San Diego. It's huge. And what we've calculated is that our three-acre farm will produce approximately about $2.3 million in produce. So as you can see from the numbers, there literally could be over 300 three-acre farms here in San Diego. And we built a model just to capture nine of those. And as you'll see, the profitability on just nine farms, and again, that's just San Diego. That doesn't count Orange County, Los Angeles, the rest of the country. So the market's huge. Now, I think another part is vision. That's today, and obviously competition will always be following you. So unless you have a vision of what you're gonna do in the future, you're, you're a shooting star. So what we've realized out of our homework was that, okay, there's rooftop capability, but right now when real estate prices are depressed and there's lots of land here in San Diego, one of the benefits of living, you know, San Diego's usually expensive and it's, you know, gravel, you know, that's all, wow, why we live here and all this stuff and, you know, pay for the beautiful weather. Well, this is one of those rare occasions that the beautiful weather actually makes the business even more successful. So what we, what we realized is, is let's go to the ground. Let's build these farms in high traffic areas so that we can actually get the car views, the branding opportunity, allow people to actually come into the store and see exactly what we're doing. And so to us, that was priceless because you can't spend the kind of money on marketing that give people the confidence of when they actually feel, touch it, and see it themselves. So it's gonna, what we feel is it's gonna go from the ground to the rooftops, and rooftops are very close. Uh, we've actually teamed up with a rooftop greenhouse company that's been building roof rooftop greenhouses since 1932. So they've got all the experience they need. And combined with our secret sauce of how we do the inside, we can pretty much build these farms anywhere. So it'll go from ground to rooftop and then to eventually these multi-story buildings where you know, each level will have vertical growing within it so we can produce a tremendous amount of food. But because of my past business, of basically being R&D. We caught, I think it's about $35 million in eight years to develop this self-eating beverage container. We didn't want to do that again. You want to build a business that actually has positive cash flow, and from that positive cash flow, go ahead and do all your R&D. The other way, let me tell you, very scary. It's not a fun time, unless you succeed and do it, but it's rare. So management. Best idea, best concept, best market. It does not matter unless the management team can execute. And via, instead of going into much detail about our individual backgrounds here, I think, again, it's better just an overall concept of where it's at. Because of my background in entrepreneurship, business, and renewable energies, my partner's Mike's background in agriculture and farming and vertical farming and all the things that he's done, we had the capability together to put this together in order to have a successful model. 
But one thing we realize is, is that we don't know it all. So what do you do? Well, now you sit down and you strategically go through the areas within your business to say, okay, what do I need? How can I succeed? And then you go out and start looking for people that fill those positions. And as you can see, we've actually put together a really great world-class team. And each one of the people within our team has a specialty that will help us succeed. Now, in these trying economic times, sometimes a team is just not good enough, especially if you're trying to do a paradigm shift, if you're trying to take an old industry and do something new with it. So what we realized is, is that we need to actually go get political support. We actually need to get community support. We need to get university support. We need to really allow to educate people to say, look, there is a new way. There is a new opportunity here. So we went and did that. We act support of uh, different mayors and, and city officials. As you can see, some of the child obesity in California Center for Sustainable Energy um, and the different universities that we've either been referred by, worked with, or have helped. Now, go to market. OK, team, product, market, everything's great. How do you bring it there? Well, basically, this model doesn't get any better. Since we are building a farm to support one individual community, we don't really care what's going on 10 miles away. We just matter, what matters to us is what's happening within that community. So, and as you'll see, this business is so profitable because of the efficiencies we brought to it that we literally could budget $100,000 a year in marketing. Now that marketing is only going to be spent within that individual community. So not only are we able to really let people know that we're here, but we can support that community, uh, schools, community organizations, and so on. We really make the community part of us. And then part of the thing of finding people that can do it, if you don't understand or you're not as good as that thing, we actually reached out to Bev Oster who's a very well-respected PR person here in San Diego, and her specialty is green and agriculture. It fit perfect for what we're doing. Roland Hansen, he's on our board, and if you look him up in any Bill Gates books, Bill Gates personally credits Roland with naming Windows Windows and branding Microsoft. He also did the same thing for Neutrogena and Nautilus. The guy's a, a, marketing gen a branding genius. So we, we have him on board to help us get that message out. Our marketing message is about as great as it gets. Higher quality, save money, eco-friendly, better tasting, safer. I, I don't think there's another button or buzzword we could probably throw in there, but it's all true. So all of that combined, you also need to make sure that you can show investors that there's actually a market out there. I mean, since we can, we can grow organic food at at non-organic pricing, we believe that the general public market's there for sure. But we need to show that in the beginning, until we can get the people to our door, that there are established businesses out there that would actually want to purchase our product. So we actually got an LOI uh, from Whole Foods and Barona, basically saying they'll buy everything that we grow. So it's another huge component on convincing the investors that this is really the right thing to do. The other thing is, is really putting together a, a timeline. You know, and this is, you know, it's self-explanatory. I mean, really what you're showing the investor and the people interested is that, okay, you're going to do nine farms. Well, how's that going to happen? All nine going to open up at once? Are you going to stage them? So really this just kind of shows how you're going to do it and where your financing is going to come for when you're going to start your farms. So in summary, and, and like Dale said, summary is how, where I kind of tell you why hometown farms is the place to be and why you guys should be investing in us, but again, not the appropriate area. So really my summary to you is this. Commercial, vertical, organic, urban farming is a must. With the benefits to our society, the benefits to our environment, the benefits to our health are just enormous. So really what I ask you is, please join us. Please try to help us make this new industry come to life. That's it.